And if I can share that perspective with people that you can't understand what's going on today, the only thing you have is your control of your behaviors. And I will tell everybody out there that your good behavior has an instant result. It's called good progress. And bad behavior has an instant result, bad progress. And so if you focus in on your behaviors and align those to where you want to be or better, you're going to progress to where you want to be or better. If you're not aligned, you're not going to be where you want to be or better. Yo, 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 welcome to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mr. David Meltzer. We are in his beautiful backyard here in Orange County, California. Thanks for having me, David. Welcome to the bubble, Chris. I've been waiting a long time to finally get to meet you. We've swam in the same pools for so long. Same friends from D to D to content to podcasting. It's just exciting to have you here at my home. Oh, man, it's, it's great to be here. So for those that don't know David, he is a incredible entrepreneur, comes from the sports world uh, as, a, as a sports agent, runs Sports One, uh, and has was uh, Jerry Maguire, the movie, was actually based off of the agency that you founded, right? Yeah, CEO of Lee Steinberg, yeah. yeah. So you got a lot of... Fun stuff. And even before sports, you know, understanding, I, I don't know if you know this, I went to law school, got out and got into technology. And that's how I got into sports, which is really important as an entrepreneur. And you know this because you've had an eclectic background. I've always focused in on my skills, my knowledge and my desire. So I graduated law school to be an oil and gas litigator because I wanted to make a lot of money. And that was the area of that law was that paying paid the a lot most. Of money. Yeah, oil and gas. And I found the internet in 1992 told my mom the oh, internet existed in 92 exa- I, for some reason i don't remember it existed in exactly 92. in fact my mom said the internet's going to be a fad and i was making the biggest mistake of my life <laughs> justice scalia when i started working because we put legal research online mm. uh in 92 wow. we exited in 95 for 3.4 billion wow but scalia told me in the interim between there justice scalia told me straight out people will never do research on a computer you need books are you kidding <laughs> oh, and it's man. a valuable lesson about ignorant arrogance that even the experts in the world when you are stuck into a vacuum of circumstance and knowledge it limits your unbelievably enough your own self-image it limits your own capability of expanding and growing and i see that today with ai yeah i was going to ask you if, if you think the same thing is with ai right now yeah absolutely i see it all the time people see ai as a master so they become afraid of it instead of utilizing as an incredible servant um but I've always looked at things in a more expansive manner and always looked within to figure out what I want to do outside of me. And so did Lee Steinberg. And the reason I got hired, went to law school, frustrated athlete, maybe kind of like you, right? <laughs> I wanted to be a pro, ain't gonna happen. Uh, and I probably looked like the other 2,500 resumes that Lee saw every month. Mm. And I know that because when I was CEO of Lee Steinberg, I saw 2,500 resumes that look, hey, I'm a lawyer, I like sports, I wanna be a sports agent. But the reason Lee hired me 48 hours after meeting me was because of my technology background. He saw the future. I raised a lot of money as well later on in my life from Sand Hill Road, from Sequoia to Texas Pacific, got into venture side of stuff. But what was interesting, Lee saw the future of sports in venture capital and technology. And I was the only one that he ever had, had met had that, that had the law degree, had the sports desire, you know, agent kind of Jerry Maguire love, but also was really a finance guy and more importantly, a technology person. Yeah. And that's how I ended up with my dream job, not trying to get it, not thinking I would ever be CEO of a sports agency, let alone the most notable one, which led me for two decades now to, you know, I get old, so they call you, you know, legendary sports executive. So you got your law degree. (laughs) Did did you, so did you practice law? Never Never practice law, so never got your bar? I took my mom, so my mom didn't believe in technology. So the deal that I made with my mom was that I would take the bar just in case the internet didn't work. Uh, that sounds <laughs> I like, passed. I passed. That, that sounds like what most uh, college students are doing now. Hey, get it just in case whatever you actually love and want to do yeah. doesn't work out. I don't mind hedging a bet. <laughs> and I don't mind learning. You know, one of the things also, you know, a, a good friend of mine, a lot of good friends of mine, but, you know, a lot of guys like I think Gary Vee are misunderstood in the entrepreneurial space because they talk about not going to college. Right. Um, 
I think they're misinterpreting some of what my friends believe in, which is continuous education. Yeah, just there's different kinds of education. Yes. I promise you, you follow Chris Lee around or you follow Dave Meltzer around or Gary Vee around for a week. You'll learn what you need to do more about being an entrepreneur than going to college for four years. Absolutely. But there's other things of value of going to my girls all go to college. Yeah. Two are entrepreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, college can be for you, can't be for you, right? Like, it, I think the biggest key is like that there's not a one size fits all for anyone, but that continuous education is absolutely necessary for the rest of your life. And it's so accessible and inexpensive. You know, you're an investor like I am. Yep. So I always say the one great lesson that I learned from losing everything which may be something that you have some experience with going yeah, bankrupt. My, my crowd definitely knows about that. All right, yeah. good. So I lost over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Right. When BK. And so tell me, tell me about that. So you've made hundreds of millions. Yeah. Lost over a hundred. How does that go down? I mean, I, yeah. I can imagine how that goes down, but how did that go down? Yeah. Well, ego edging goodness and gold and greatness out of my life. Um, I thought that I knew everything. So from mm. the time I graduated law school, I made a million dollars nine months out of law school, made hundreds of millions in gross revenue, netted over a hundred million myself in all types of different investments. So I thought I was Midas because everyone thought I was Midas. Yeah, yeah, and everything was working. And I never asked for help. Mm. People ask me, what's the best piece of advice that you would give your 18 year old self? It's the same thing I remind myself humbly every morning. May God put in front of me 10 people that I can help and may God put at least 10 people that can help me as well. Mm. And I don't ever forget to ask for help because you know what happened to me is that I had a, a very large line of credit at a private bank in San Diego. And so about $40 million, mm. that, unused, yeah. unused. That's, that's a large line. So I get it. I have a lot of real estate, 2007 and eight. I have to draw, all my properties are doing well, by the way. I right. bought right, even through the bad time. Right. I wasn't, I was in a great position. I got into a lawsuit, mm. I needed cash. I also wanted to infuse some capital in some other projects because I was gonna, my philosophy in real estate is never have to sell and you'll never yeah, lose money. Absolutely. It, it literally is it's a game. It's a great philosophy. Right, and you've been yeah. in real estate. So what happened is I go into my private bank. I've been with them over 10 years. I was one of their youngest millionaires that put the money into the bank early. And I go in to get my guy, Chris, who I'd been with for 10 years. And they're like, oh, Chris is gone. <laughs> he's, he's no longer here. Right. So then some dude comes out and he's like, can I help you? I'm the new sheriff in town. Right. I'm like, well, I'm Dave Meltzer. Oh, how can I help you? I'm like, well, I just need a $5 million draw on my line. I'm in a little civil lawsuit and I need some cash to fund this and that. Oh, nobody called you. I'm like, no, no one told me Chris is uh. gone. No, no, no. Nobody called you. The bank's not doing well. Oh, I'm like, oh, so unless you want to reapply, we have a million dollars for you. Unless it goes from 40 to one to one. Oh, now people, Disgusting. I know this is not, this is first world problem shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's fine. I get it. And most people, including me had no clue. Right. But when you think you have that much money liquid right. besides what you have liquid, it changes your perspective very quickly and your strategy very quickly. And then when you're in a downturn place where people like you and I are losing everything. Yeah in that 2008 period to 2009, things move really fast. Yeah. And so you may have over $100 million on paper. Right. With real estate. But when you start not meeting your obligations yeah. and you start leveraging your relationships with other people and they're not doing well, you fall below the line into what's called blame, shame, and justification. Mm. Not only can't you get more money, but everyone starts blaming you because they can't provide or get money either. And then shit starts falling and more people blame you. It is a vacuum of- It's a vicious cycle. It's terrible. <laughs> and the worst, my, my worst part of it, and Chris, you may have had this when you went bankrupt. I did not want anyone, I, I never wanted to take money. You started your company with no money. Yeah. Very successfully. I get that, because that's the way I was. But I had friends who were like, Dave, let me just give you 10 grand. Everything you touch turns to gold. No, no, I don't need 10 grand. Yeah. Right? I, that's not a big, no, no, I, I want to be able to participate in this. I'm like, all right, fine. Those were the people that hurt me the most. You know why? Why is that? Because they ended up losing everything themselves, their million dollar houses, their boats, their planes. But because I was more of a public figure, right? 
and I had taken investment from them. They never mentioned it was only 10 grand, but they went around my hometown. Dave Meltzer is the reason I went bankrupt. He screwed me. He screwed me. He screwed. He lost grand. my money in that deal. He uh, never said it was 10 grand. Oh, yeah. But I still have right. people today going, yeah, you know, so-and-so uh, doesn't like you. Well, I'm glad he doesn't because he's protecting and promoting me from people like him that I don't need in my life. Mm, that's rough. That's rough. So how did you make it through that? I mean, that, that is a terrible yeah. thing to have to go through. So, so you don't, you're going through this lawsuit. You start, everything just starts seizing up. I mean, it, and no matter where you were, whether you were worth a hundred million bucks zero, or, zero. or $10,000 <laughs> back in 08, I mean, everybody saw this, right? Like credit card lines going from like, I have $15,000 available on my credit. Then all of a sudden the credit card company decided, no, you don't, you have zero and you go to the, the, the get your groceries and you know, whatever, like this happened on so many levels for so many people. So how did, how did you get through that? Yeah. Well, first my wife. Mm. I know you and I yeah. uh, value our marriage. Absolutely. And, and nothing is more important. My wife saved my life. She started to change my mindset, my heart set, and my handset two years before the bankruptcy. Mm. Uh, before all this shit really hit the fan, my wife threatened to leave me. Mm. She told me I was lost. Really? Um, yeah. It, real How old quickly. Were your kids I, at this time? So, three kids under 10 at the time, all daughters. I hadn't had my son yet. So, imagine this. I come home at 5.30 in the morning. I'm with a guy named Little John, the rapper. We went to the Grammy Awards together. And I'd lied to my wife about having a business meeting because she had said to me earlier, don't go. You're partying too much. You're not paying attention to the family or your business. I'm concerned about you. So I lied to her and I went with John to go party at the Grammy Awards. I came home at 5.30 wasted. I walked in the door the woman of my dreams who I've known since the fourth grade who has always just told me the truth as hurtful as the truth is mm. has always been the reflection of my insecurity and my strength told me I'm not happy and I'm leaving you mm. and you better take stock in who you are and what you want to become or you're going to die and I can't have me and my girls witness this you need to change how did, how did that make you feel in the moment? I told her I hated her. Ooh. Now, here's the interesting thing as I look back. I had told earlier when I turned 30, my dad and my mom that I hated them because they pointed out to me, my mom pointed out that I didn't believe in God. Hmm. And, she, and, I, and I said, I don't believe in God. She said, yes, you do. You believe in the wrong God. Then my dad, who I hadn't talked to in 10 years, my parents, my dad left when I was five, he gave me a jacket with no pockets to be buried in for my 30th birthday. And I told him, he wow. said, you're just like me, son. I'm worried about you. Money's not your God. Money does not buy love and happiness. You need to change. This jacket is to remind you it had no pockets that you can't take anything with when you're gone. I said to him, I hate you. Yeah. I hate you. I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, overseller and back end seller. I'm nothing like you. I have my world. Why, I, why, do you, why do you think you responded that way? Because I knew it was true. Six years after that, I'm running Lee Steinberg. My best friend, I invite him to the Masters with Joe Montana, Wayne Gretzky, Warren Moon, all my guys going back in the cabins with Curtis Strange, going to the wheels up party, all the things, pri private net jet party and f private jet in. And he tells me he doesn't want to go with me because he doesn't like who I've become and who mm. I hang out with. I told him I hated him. Mm. So now here I am two weeks after that. Truth, truth was hurting. Yeah. yeah. Everyone else loved me, by the way, except for my mom, my dad. Or at least my dad. The, perceived, the perception was that yeah. they loved you. Yeah, well, you got that. My mom, my dad, my best friend, Rob, and now my wife. The only four people I perceived hated me. That actually mattered. Were the only four people who truly loved me. Wow. And so I'm sitting there, and I tell my wife I hate her. I go to bed, I wake up in hate thinking about how I'm going to steal her joy and happiness by taking all the money and my kids, all the stupid things people think about when they're hurt because hurt people hurt people. We know that from right. social media. Yeah. I'm sure all your comments are all positive like <laughs> mine. And so anyway, this is how God stepped into my life at that time. As I was thinking all these hurtful thoughts, all these fears that I had and that was manifesting itself in anger, I look over in my closet, and for the first time in years, what do I see? A jacket. Mm. 
I, I still get choked up today because I, I looked at it and I thought to myself, shit, I don't hate my mom. I don't hate my dad. I don't hate my best friend. And I certainly don't hate my wife. I hate myself. Mm. I hate myself. I am a liar. I am a cheater. I am an overseller, a back end seller, a manipulator. I hate myself. I need to take stock in who I am and what I want to become. You started embracing the truth. For, and ironically, my faith grew stronger and stronger. See, I believe there's a distance between behavior and results. Yeah. And there's two necessary requirements in shortening the distance that appeases human nature, meaning that the faster we receive the results that we want or better from the behaviors that we perform, the yeah. easier it is to continue the behavior. Yeah. That's why negative behavior is so easy to continue because we don't see the negative results. Right. So we think the positive results of today are part of the negative behaviors. So as I look there and realize I need wisdom and I need faith. Hmm. I need to find people who sit in a situation I want to be in, which is the exact way you became a success. You told me your story, how you found someone. Everyone else is there to make money. You found someone there to give you directions to where they are. Right. And then two, faith. And my faith is simple. It's there's something bigger than me that loves me more than my mom. Mm. And it applies to every theory, philosophy, religion, and spirituality that I've ever seen. Yeah. Most people, and I don't need to define it in those terms. So for me, I'm a simple, best option faith guy. I believe in an omniscient, all-powerful, unified, infinite system, source, God, that loves me, protects me, and promotes me at all times, yeah. even more than my mom would. Yeah. And bam, wisdom and faith got me to where, and through that bankruptcy, I wasn't scared. In fact, the biggest fear my wife had throughout this whole experience was that I wasn't afraid when I lost everything. Mm. Because I had wisdom and I had faith. Right. And that shortened the distance between my recovery as well. So if you don't mind, let's dive a little bit deeper so into this with your wife. So you tell her you hate her. Yeah. Right? She's like, leaving. She's leaving. <laughs> Where do we bridge the gap to getting to this wisdom and faith and right that, that actually Great got you out? It's so interesting because, you know, I do so many interviews like you. Yeah. Both sides of them. Yeah. And it's interesting when I get a question that nobody asked that I know I got a great interviewer when someone asked me a question that I've never heard. So the way that I got through it is that I actually did what my wife said, which is I took stock in who I was and what I want to become. And I came up with four values, which still today is the foundation, the founding interview here gratitude was missing from my life. I had lost the perspective to find the light, the love and the lessons in everything. Forgiveness. I had lost the ease that forgiveness and empathy had given me in order to effectuate the source, the power, the omniscient, all powerful that I was connected to and through. Which I believe forgiveness is one of the hardest things. It's what right. I study every day. Right. Yeah. Like gratitude's fairly easy. Right? Everyone has it. It's yeah. innate in our being. Right. But forgiveness, it takes like concerted effort. Yeah, yeah, and it's shortening the distance and understanding at what level are you willing to forgive and why and for the sake of what are you forgiving. Right. Accountability was another, uh, which has evolved over the years, but accountability to me gave me back the control in my life. Hmm. Instead of giving away my control to other people by this big Blame. void, shame, yeah. justification, yeah. Right, I am versus this is what I want people to think I am. Yeah. It's a huge void for our kids today. Yeah. Right? You go from I want to be or I want people to think I am to I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? How am I responsible, accountable, attracting, or perceiving this? And what am I supposed to learn from it? Mm. And then the effective communication side that it wasn't just my ability like you to effectively communicate obviously innate in our energetic and genetic inheritance. We can sell, we can connect to people, right. but it was that connection to source or God that changed my life. Mm -hmm. And how was I allowing life to come through me? Not to me as a victim, not even for me, like a lot of optimists out there, buying shit I didn't need to impress people I didn't like, mm -hmm. but through me in appreciation, acknowledgement and asking for more, not living in a zero sum game where I'm trading and negotiating everything, but a value add world where there's more than enough of everything for everyone. Abundance. Abundance, exactly. And so I went to my wife and said, will you help me? Hmm. Would you help me? How long did it take from saying I hate you till you said those words? So 
initially when she was packing up, so she I had packing. to say something. Yeah. And so I said, will you please stay and help me? You don't have to stay married to me. You, you can still file a separation or whatever, but I hear you. Will you help me? I need help with gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration. And I can't do it without you. So if you love me, will you stay and help me? I'm not asking you to stay married to me, but will you just stay and help me to save me? And she said, yes. And she saved my life. She saved my marriage. And it allows me the greatest thing in faith to know that when outcomes happen in my life, that I don't, see, I, I don't believe human beings have the ability to understand or know outcomes. That's why faith is so important and wisdom is so important. And so take the worst day of my life. Two years before I went bankrupt, I was protected and promoted. So when I went bankrupt, I was protected and promoted. And I will tell you today, those two days, here I am 15 years after bankruptcy, 17 years after my wife was gonna leave me. To this day, the defining moments of my life, the meaning of my past, of the defining moments of my life, are two incidences at the time when they occurred that most people would have felt so punished they would have thought of even taking their own life. But instead, it has revealed itself as the greatest protection I've ever received, the greatest promotion, and the greatest love I've ever received in my life. Yeah. And if I can share that perspective with people that you can't understand what's going on today, the only thing you have is your control of your behaviors. And I will tell everybody out there that your good behavior has an instant result. It's called good progress. And bad behavior has an instant result, bad progress. And so if you focus in on your behaviors and align those to where you want to be or better, you're going to progress to where you want to be or better. If you're not aligned, you're not going to be where you want to be or better. I love that. Thank you. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't usually get emotional while I'm doing, <laughs> while I'm doing the interview. So, you know, I, I've been as an interviewee, I got an emotional sharing my story and I appreciate you, uh, being vulnerable and, and sharing that. Um, yeah, it touched my heart. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, um, also reminded me of a, a few instances of my own life going through similar things. Uh, you know, it's, it's a harsh realization when you realize that, uh, your loved ones aren't happy with you. Yeah. And for and good that, reason and that they're right. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, I can just think back of different times in my life where I was full of ego, full of, you know, and, and uh, wasn't aligned with my wife, wasn't aligned with my family, and, and uh, how it hurt to hear the truth. Yeah. And so I appreciate you, you opening up and, and sharing that. Well, it's interesting because forgiveness is a reflection of love. Yeah. And we can't forgive everything. In fact, I believe, you know, the ego always exists. And so understanding what you and I have experienced and everyone in the world is that we're afraid. We're afraid of two things. We're afraid of our past and afraid of our future. The human being, its capability created a thing called the ego that protects us from that fear. Mm. So it prescribes needs to protect you from that fear. Need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, guilty, resentful. And so the better that we get of understanding, we can't get rid of fear and we can't get rid of ego. But what we can do is utilize time to shorten the distance between fear and ease. Yeah. And so if we look at the clues of fears and identify the patterns of the ego, we can actually reduce the amount of time we spend interfering with the omniscient, all powerful, all knowing source yeah. that I am. What am I doing to interfere with it? So I'm very pragmatic in my spirituality and my emotions that I am constantly in the practice of identifying fear. And instead of going over it, under it, through it, around it, lying, cheating, manipulating and denying it, I just stop and breathe remind, remember, and recollect who I am and what walks with me and inside of me. And I just try to figure out what I'm doing to interfere with it. And then I roll in the right trajectory with the right behaviors that creates the right progress to get to where I want to be or better, utilizing wisdom, learning lessons of the past, and faith that I'm part of this unbelievable 
unified, abundant, infinite source, value add world or more than enough. Yeah. I mean, you clearly have a lot of incredible frameworks that you've studied and shared and, and practiced, and practiced, right? I mean, they're just rolling off the tip of your tongue, which is which is phenomenal. And and I think too often in life, people never reflect and create, right? Like you've clearly reflected on these instances and created the steps to go through the frameworks that have ha allowed you to go through difficulties like this, losing hundred million dollars, right? Like yeah. that's. Anybody listening on this, like it, that's hard for them to imagine, right? Most yeah. people will never experience that as a net worth, let alone have that Lose completely it. stripped from them. Do you, you want to know what the hardest part? And some people, this may resonate with them regardless, because zero, zero when you go bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> and is it chapter seven or 11? 11. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to go when I went bankrupt and tell my mom that I lost everything. Hmm. My mom had warned me about ego. She had warned me about my hubris. She had warned me about my faith. And she was right. And so I had to go tell her. But imagine this. As I walked over, the only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy my mom a house. She, single mom, raised six kids. Five of them, not School me, teacher, right? School teacher. Five of them, right? Education was our way out of the projects in Akron, Ohio. Five of them went to the Ivy Leagues, graduated not just from the Ivy Leagues, but got scholarships and graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. They're amazing. Harvard, Penn, Columbia. She obviously did something right. Did something right. I had to go tell my mom, the only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy her that house initially. Then it got into buying things to be happy, more things to be happy, different things to be happy, buy things I don't need to impress people I don't like. She, I come to the door and I realize not only did I lose everything, but I did not take my name off of my mom's title when I bought her, her second house. So I lost her house and she oh. had to move. So I had to tell my mom, oh. as I knocked on the door, mom, I lost everything, but we have to make a plan for where, where you're gonna live. I lost your house. When I told my mom, I thought she was gonna drop down like in the old you know, Red Fox, Elizabeth, I'm coming. You know, like, I thought I was gonna destroy her. Yeah. And there was my mom. She said, are you okay? I said, "Wow, huh? She said, do you need any money? I said, mom, I don't think you heard me because I was crying. I said, I lost everything, but mom, I lost your house. You're going to need to be evicted and moved. They're foreclosing on your home. I heard you. What can I do? How can I help you, sweetheart? Wow. You'll be fine. I still, the unconditional love, the, the lesson that I learned from standing at that door and facing my greatest fear, not just admitting that I lost everything, because I'm sure you had this fear when you went bankrupt. What is everybody going to think of me? Yeah. How am I ever going to make money again? Nobody's going to trust me. Everyone thinks I'm a loser. Everyone's going to hate me. Everyone's going to blame me. Even my mom, it's going to kill her. But that's not what happened. What it did, it was separated the people that truly loved me and those that were manipulating, using me, cheating me, stealing from me, and bleeding me. So in that moment when she said that, how did that make you feel? Well, after I got done crying, I had never experienced unconditional love like that as a grown man. I'm sure as, as babies, as a dad, I know that I'm sure I did. Yeah. And that's why my siblings and I are how we are. But as a grown man, to experience unconditional love was an incredible thing to aspire to. I can uh, I can definitely empathize with that. Uh, you know, when when I went bankrupt, um, my dad was an investor in my business, and oh. and he was a school teacher that had nothing. He put half of his life savings. He, the stock market had got cut in half, and then he took it all out and took half of that and put it into my business, which ended up failing. And, you know, yeah. when, uh, when, I, when I had to go to him, like, <laughs> he, uh, he said, I know you'll make it right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, th those type of experiences are, like, some of the most powerful when you realize it's not about money, right, that, that this person actually loves me for who I am, not what I have. And... Uh, you know, I, I had a different experience with a different investor that uh, wasn't quite as 
as, as gentle or loving. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, like uh, th- that is like one of the most powerful experiences that any human being can go through. I, I had another one that's interesting. And, you know, as a founder, I think it's important for people to know it's both sides. I have a theory. You, you speak around the world like I do. And I get a lot of new speakers. You know, Fenster was one of them we had on your podcast. And they all get to their first speech and there's about 100 people there. And they're always speaking for free, but they're lying to everyone that they're paid. And they get there in front of 100 people. And what happens is 10 people come up to them after they speak and they say, oh my gosh, I love your, they may even say beyond I love your speech, you changed my life. Right. And this mathematical equation is one that I think is important for all founders, all entrepreneurs and all speakers and coaches and everyone. What is happening is that everyone has a frequency. And this is true on social media and podcasting right. especially. I believe 10% so. of the people are going to love you no matter what. Not unconditionally like our mom and dad. Right. 10% of the people though are going to hate you. They're not gonna come up to you when you're speaking either and tell you. They might DM you later, <laughs> yeah. chickens. Uh, yep. But 10% of everyone is going to hate you. And then through rep- repetitive execution and communication, you can get more and more of the 80% in the middle yeah. that just aren't aware of you. It's interesting. We, uh, in sales, we call this the 10-80-10 rule, right? 10% will say yes no matter what, right? It could be the worst presentation, presentation ever. offer, Your anything. Frequency. 10% will say no no matter what. You could show up with a bag of gold and they <laughs> won't take it, right? No strings attached. And, and 80% are fence sitters. They're, they're still up in the air. Where am I, I going to fall? So, it, yeah, that's, uh, that rings true for me. Yeah, and but when you get to the real deal, the one that is unconditional and inspiring, when I lost everything, my wife I've known since the fourth grade hated me. I asked her to go study at sixth grade camp. My friend Rob, who I mentioned, asked her for me because I was too afraid. So she embarrassed me and said, no, tell him to ask me himself. He <laughs> yelled it to everyone, so I threw an egg at her. My wife hated me until I was 25. Uh, and then we finally dated at 26. Uh, so anyway, When I lost everything, I caught my wife crying in the kitchen to her uncle, who was the father of one of my best friends growing up, who I constantly annoyed to try to get me to go out with his cousin. And she always, he was always like, she hates you, dude, don't even try. Hmm. So this uncle who's known me since I've been nine as well is Julie's uncle. He's seen everything, everything. And she's crying. I'm really afraid. You know, do you think he's going to be able to pull this out? And she doesn't know that we have a very large house in Rancho Santa Fe that I'm witnessing this because I'd come in and there and I'm heartbroken that my wife has doubt and fear of me and my right. capability. And he looks at her and she's crying and I'm crying while listening like, fuck, I've screwed this up. Excuse my language. He looks at her and he says, I've known this kid since he's been nine. I cannot wait to see what he does with his back against the wall. Mm. And man, my tears, I still, when things get tough, no matter how good you think people have, you don't know what's going on in their thoughts, in their mind, in their life. But when things get tough, I think of standing in front of my mom and the unconditional love, belief, and feeling she has for me. But I also think of my wife's uncle. Just that cheering for you exactly my back's against the wall now when i start my speeches a lot of times i'll ask and i'll do this at aspire coming up this week with the other guests of yours i'll always start with who here grew up with nothing raise your hand and half of the people raise their hand and i always say i feel sorry for the rest of you it's true because they will not know what julie's uncle was talking about because they've never been there and you've been there You've been there and there is a freedom and there is an inspiration that comes when your back is all the way against the wall. And that's where you have a choice. You know, in football, you you were a football coach and, and, and in wrestling, I think this is true. There comes a moment when you get those first kids and you're going to, you coach high school for years and you see it's their first time playing football. Vincey Glenn, 11 year vet who uh, was worked for me and and was uh, one of our guys played for the Chargers and the Saints, he, he told me this. There's a moment for each kid, and they get hit for the first time. Hmm. And you can see it in their eyes. 
they either say, if I can look up, I can get up. And they get up and they're ready. They love it. And then they're the other ones that never want to get hit again. Never want to go through that. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'm a try me guy, not yeah. a why me guy. I love that. <clears throat> there, there's a, a lot of power in getting hit. You know, the, some people just never even fully experience that. Right? Going to zero, I always say, is like my superpower. Yeah. Right? Like it, it, the, the fact that you and I have both gone through this, you know, experienced the highest of highs and lowest of lows. And, but for me, and I, I'd assume you'd agree with this, when you go through the lowest of lows, you realize it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Not even close. And it's the, my favorite book is the monster at the end of the book, the Sesame Street book with Grover. Yes. That's what z going and losing everything is. It's yes. the monster at the end of the book. All you find there's a monster is at the end lovable, of the book. cuddly David. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and, and I think like that is what has made you successful. Like the, you know, the fact that you realize, hey, it's really not that bad. So if this is the worst it can get, what's the top? What does the top look like? Yeah. And, and what risk am I willing to take now? Yeah, and also, what else do I think is the worst? Because it's probably not that bad. And two, here, here's the trajectory of time that I've learned. I study a lot of Einstein. I study a lot of relativity. I study applied mathematics and what's called theoretical physics. So you don't have to get down and dirty. In fact, most people don't realize that even Einstein, in the mathematics sense, in the physics sense, wasn't like a down and dirty scientist. He was an applied mathematician and a theoretical physicist. Metaphysics, quantum physics, and physics. And so I followed that path through my idea of find someone who sits in the situation you want to be in yeah. and ask him for directions. And so within the context of that, what I've learned is that I want to find out where the limits are. Okay. So the limits of my past are determined by the meaning I give it. Mm. So I'm constantly looking, is the meaning of the failure, successes, mistakes, pain, uh, defining moments, historical relevances, are, and successes, are they aligned with where my self-image is and where I want to become? And Because it's the meaning of my past that limits me. Right. And then even more importantly, as I apply the meaning of the past to the daily activities I have, which is limited by 24 hours, which is easily applied in math, and I good at you know the st typical Covey-esque or Napoleon Hill type of utilization of daily activities and time and productivity, accessibility and gratitude. But where most people fail is where the freedom of bankruptcy takes you. We will never overachieve our own self-image. Yep. And if we give that meaning to things that don't exist, the monsters at the end of the book, we're gonna limit our self-image. And then we're going to limit our experience and journey in the level in which we can utilize our awareness and frequency and vibration to achieve even more. Look at the greatest people. Most of the greatest people that achieve the most are crazy mm. because they are going beyond their, their reality goes beyond most people's imagination. Elon Musk, Branson, right. Gates, they, their, their reality goes beyond most people's imagination. Absolutely. And that's what I utilize time and relativity. What meaning am I giving to my past according to the activities in today to increase my self-image so that I can achieve more of what I think I want and learn from it? I love that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that every single person on the earth was put here with a specific calling and has a specific value that they can add to the world that is unique and different and yeah, the other might be some similarities what would you say yours is oh that's easy i'm on a mission to empower over a billion people to be happy defined by the ability to make a lot of money help a lot of people and have a lot of fun to enjoy the consistent persistent pursuit of their potential in doing so so what i'm looking for is actually why i'm here on a saturday morning not playing golf but talking to you I'm looking to empower someone like you that's gonna empower a thousand to empower a thousand. Because if I can empower a thousand Chris Lees in the world to empower another thousand, to empower another thousand, a thousand times a Compound. thousand, a million, a million times a thousand is a billion. And here's the interesting thing. If I can empower over a billion people, because I don't limit myself, over a billion people to do this, to live in abundance, to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun, that's one eighth of the earth. Right. So humbly, I'm put 
on earth to change it for the better. I'm put on earth through gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration to utilize kindness as my guidepost in order to effectuate abundance, a value add world for more people simply to be happy. And I know this about applied mathematics and physics, by the way, that one particle of light overcomes a million particles of darkness. You see, I want everyone to know this about social media because you hear a lot of negativity. In fact, our subconscious holds 40,000 thoughts. 80% of those thoughts are negative. In our subconscious, unfortunately, 90% of our thoughts are repetitive. So you're gonna get a lot of negativity in the world. But here's what I know about negative actions, words, thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. They're loud, but they're weak. Mm. So true, people can see through them. They're weak, man. So I'm trying to liberate people to show their light because one particle of that light will overcome a million particles of that darkness in a scientific manner. And so I am put here on earth to change the earth one Chris Lee at a time to empower them with not only the values, but the daily practices and the execution of the values and the daily practices in order to aggregate, accelerate, and compound exponentially the light. I love that. Well, I'm excited to help you achieve that because that's exactly the mission that I want to achieve. And, and that's really what it's about, right? Like empowering others. And so I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. And if you I'm will allow me, I, I want to offer your entire community, which is continually growing. I am one of the few people I give away my book. I don't know if you know this. No. So I will give away my book to your community. I will sign it, send it pay for shipping and the book to anyone in your audience. If they just email me directly, david at dmelzer.com, david at dmelzer.com, put it in the notes, but anyone listening to this ebook, audio book, or signed copy, I will pay for everything. Shipping the book. Just send an email. I want to change the earth. I know that my book goes and reviews a lot of the values and daily practices that we discussed today and more. Which book is this? Connected to goodness. Connected to goodness. Guys, if you heard that we're going to be dropping that in the notes on the show go ahead and send an email to david he's going to send you a free copy appreciate that that's a ton of value where's the best place to uh follow you on social media just google me because i'm on every platform at david Meltzer. where would you say you're most active instagram (laughs) everywhere everywhere (laughs) instagram tiktok youtube linkedin facebook and everyone's dying to know is that you running it or is that a big team running it that's great so i have a big team yeah. And so I don't post, I create, and my model is capture what I do, guys, modify it to every single platform, which yep. is why I say that's the best place to see me is where you like to be. Yep. I'm coming into your house. I love it. And then amplify it through partners like you and other people that resonate at the same frequency. And then let's create a perpetual rabbit hole so that when people say, hey, have you heard of David Meltzer? They go to their favorite platform and they go down a David Meltzer perpetual rabbit hole that either 10% will love automatically, 10% will hate automatically, and luckily that 80% are on the fence. If you don't have the perpetual rabbit hole, you're not going to capture the 80%. All you're going to get is 10% that love you and 10% that hate you. David, first of all, thank you for your time. I know it's valuable. Thank you for stepping away from the golf course. I can resonate with that. I love golf. And so the only fact, with my son, only it, time I play. I fa- the fact that you sacrificed some of that this morning to spend some time with me, I, that, that means a ton. And uh, I mean, this interview was one of the most heartfelt. And, I mean, hit, hit me home. And, and I appreciate you opening it up and being very vulnerable. Well, two things. Number one, I have to have you on my podcast. So we've done over 1,700 episodes with the greatest minds in the world, and you are part of that community. Uh, And then two, please let me know how it could be of service or value. I have a huge network of people from doing so many shows and so many things in my life. I know you have met several of my friends, but I have so many more that need to meet you and to help you as well. So please reach out and ask for help. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Mr. David. Until next time.